Welcome to DIA Today, Democracy in America Today. I'm Matt Parks alongside Dave Corbin. Glad to have you with us as we explore the ideas behind today's headlines. How was your week, Dave? It's been a little rough. It's chilly here, 49, 50 degrees, clouds, some rain things you're just not used to in California, but uh, surviving. I mean, em- emphasis on surviving, but uh, I can't wait to see the sun again. There's a 36 hour rule here that it's got to, sh- the sun's got to show within 36 hours. So hopefully tomorrow. How about you? How's yeah. New York? No, I feel really bad for you. It was like 13 overnight with 30 mile an hour winds. So if you have a 110 year old house, you find out where all those cracks are, where things aren't perfectly sealed. And uh, we found them, I think, over the last couple of days. So we've, you know, every, every year you've got to have that week where it's just nasty, usually in January, sometimes early February, and this might be that week. Well, as everyone knows, you have to pay the weather tax in both California and New York. Whoops, that doesn't work for New York, does it? But you still have to pay your tax. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we pay a full tax. We pay three months or four months worth of tax. Well, we'll get to, we'll get to more on the weather later in the show little preview of coming attractions there. But leading off, we are going to look at one of the key headlines from the last week. The Hill reporting on the Senate vote that was inspired by Rand Paul's resolution to declare post-presidency impeachment unconstitutional. The Senate sent a strong signal Tuesday that there are not nearly enough votes to convict President Trump in an impeachment trial when only five GOP senators rejected an effort by Senator Rand Paul to declare the looming trial unconstitutional. That's obviously a a contested question, even among originalists on the right, whether or not such a a trial is constitutional. I'm persuaded that it is, but I think it's a a fairly close call, and it's not something that the, the text of the Constitution settles in any kind of obvious way. But it looks like there's not more than five votes to convict. Now, there's a few that say they voted for the resolution because they wanted to hear the debate. And so maybe they're not committed to the unconstitutionality of it and therefore to voting against conviction. But it seemed to send a pretty strong signal that whatever the merits of the impeachment itself, President Trump post-presidency would not be convicted by the Senate. Yeah, I I think that, I mean, I read it a little bit differently. I I think the definition of official uh, in that um, impeachment process uh, is central to me, but I, I can see how uh, the other argument about uh, not having the individual be uh, be uh, eligible for office thereafter that there's there's some sense to that. the The problem for me, Matt, is that I you know when I look at this, especially given our uh, effort in trying to go through uh, Tocqueville, and in the reading that we have for today, there's a actually quite a long uh, discussion that Tocqueville has of impeachment. And at the end of that discussion, he, he talks about putting that impeachment power into the legislative body's hands. And he says, and I do not know if all in all political judgment, which is impeachment, as it is intended in the United States, is not the most formidable arm that has ever been put in the hands of the majority, uh, the majority having that conduit uh, through the legislative branch. But then he says uh, in something that's rather telling, I think, that when the American republics begin to degenerate, I believe that one will be able to recognize it easily. It will be enough to see if the number of political judgments rises, if the number of impeachments rises. So using that method uh, in partisan warfare. So a a warning from Tocqueville from 190 years ago that seems rather prescient today. Yeah, that's very interesting when you think about really the first impeachment of Trump, there seemed to be at least some part of it was payback for Clinton. And uh, that wasn't the whole of the story, obviously, and, and some saw more merit in the impeachment than others. But but there was a sense that there was a score that was yet to be settled. And uh, perhaps particularly coming off the defeat of Hillary Clinton by Donald Trump, that that was more appropriate time than ever to, to settle that score. You know, the one thing that, that, that struck me and concerned me a little bit about the re- response of some of the Republicans on all this, and, you know, they have their different reasons, no doubt, for voting in favor of Senator Paul's resolution. Some, I'm sure, are persuaded by the constitutional questions, others making a political calculation. But uh, Senator Rubio was out there on the, on the Sunday morning shows and had posted to his website his response to one of the questions that he was asked, which was having to do with 
what of course would be the only real consequence if former President Trump were convicted, namely that he wouldn't be able to run for office or they could at least make it so he couldn't run for office. And he responded, who are we to tell voters who they can vote for in the future? And I thought, okay, well, you're actually a senator, right? And the Constitution has given you the power to do just that, say that this person is excluded from office and not just a a president, but any person who's convicted uh, through an impeachment trial, that's one of the penalties that's available to be applied to that person in addition to removal from office. So, you know, there's, I think, a danger for Republicans here who, who want to hold on to the Constitution and, and, you know, good for those that are sincerely convinced that there's a constitutional problem with this. If you merge that with a kind of populist twist that we're getting from Rubio, I think you begin to lose some of the moral high ground in all this. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of what we were talking about a couple months back with the Amy Coney Barrett and nominating, put for, putting forward a judicial nominee uh, during the last year of her presidency. And, and that uh, those comments of Lindsey Graham and others back in 2016 that really kind of came back to haunt you because they're not constitutionally accurate statements or assessments of what role or power uh, or what the process is. So uh, I think, yes, you, you have to be careful about what you say uh, and, and make sure that it actually aligns with, with what your constitutional authorities and prerogatives are. Yeah, I'm sure we'll have more to say on the impeachment process as it unfolds over these next couple of weeks. But in the meantime, we're going to turn to our required reading, Dave, and let you lead us through the next several chapters of Democracy in America. Sure. So if you've been following us the previous two weeks, uh, we began our coverage of Democracy in America by overviewing Tocqueville's take upon this, this great revolution that's taking place within the world uh, that has fallen upon all shores, but in an interesting way in the United States. He then goes on to say that there may be something in the American example, because it's gone further than the rest, that will be instructive uh, for the rest of mankind, and takes us through, and this was uh, last uh, week, takes us through uh, an assessment of the physical configuration of North America, when in other places he calls Uh, the external or accidental circumstances of our beginning. Uh, He talks about uh, the point of departure uh, of the United States, which was the, in part, the Puritan settlement of New England. And then he also uh, talks about uh, these townships that are really kind of the the first kind of governmental uh, association in which you see laws and civic activity play out. And remembering last week, he tells us that purposefully he begins uh, at the, the, the ground level, at the grassroots level, the township, uh, rather than going into a discussion of the federal constitution and the federal union. But it's for this part of our coverage, this uh, third uh, session on Tocqueville, that we get into his very long discussion of the federal constitution. Uh, it lasts some 70 pages in between pages 93 and 161 if you're using the Mansfield Winthrop edition. We're going to emphasize the latter part of that uh, discussion, what he makes in summary of the federal form. But um, one of the things that I would want to get to prior to covering those topics is what he has to say at the beginning of his discussion of the American federal constitution. He says, what is new in the history of societies is to see a people warned by its legislators that the wheels of the government are stopping, turn its regard on itself without haste and willing fear, sound the depth of the ill, contain itself for two entire years in order to discover the remedy at leisure. And when the remedy is pointed out, submit voluntarily to it without its costing humanity one tear or drop of blood. Here, of course, right, he's talking about the framing of the federal constitution and its ratification over that two-year period, 1787 through seven. Uh, 1789. And this this notion that how interesting it is that people who declared its independence 11 years prior and put into place a first constitution, the Articles, Articles of Confederation, would then go back and review what are some problems with that confederation and how they can build a better union, a more perfect union, to use the language of the constitution. I think it goes on to say here, When the insufficiency of the first federal constitution was felt, the exuberance of the political passions to which the revolution had given rise was calmed in part, and all the great men that it had created were still alive. This was a double blessing for America. 
the assembly, few in number, that was charged with drafting the second constitution included the finest minds and noblest characters that had ever appeared in the new world. What a great line. George Washington presided over it. One of the things we're going to see when we go through his coverage of the Constitution, much like his, his coverage of America in general, is the importance of laws and institutions, which he gets into, but the essentiality of character, of national character, that at the end of the day, it's our mores, it's the habits of our heart that in many ways will really direct the course of our republic. Yeah, it's interesting to get his take on those two years that you were talking about from the beginning of the Constitutional Convention through the ratification process and this description, they're discovering the remedy for their problems at leisure. And, you know, when I teach the debate over ratification, we've taught the Federalist Papers, anti-Federalist response, doesn't quite feel like it's leisurely. You know, they're, they're churning out essays. There's a lot that's back and forth and it's, you know, sometimes strong language. And yet it's interesting to get this perspective from somebody who can kind of take a step back and has that point of reference of the French Revolution, for example, and say, okay, yeah, there, there were no doubt passions engaged in the debate over ratification. But compared to what happened at the Bastille and following, this was a nation at leisure managing to reform its institutions. And he says, and of course, emphasizing without its costing humanity one tear or a drop of blood. And there is something really remarkable about that, that maybe it's easy for us to miss as Americans who are just used to that part of our story. And he had mentioned that in his introduction to the work that in our age, in the democratic age, a, a new science of politics is needed. And of course, this would be a similar language that uh, Madison and Hamilton would use in describing what they were up to uh, during the framing of the constitution. So it's uh, no surprise to us that one of the things that uh, Tocqueville finds remarkable about what they created was that they were able to create this hybrid form. Uh, you, you heard, you've heard me use the word hybrid often in, in our conversations in Tocqueville, between a national government and a federal government. And his argument uh, in looking at the facts that the founders created neither a purely national nor purely federal government. And this, of course, is drawn directly from Federalist 39, in which Madison suggests this is what they were after, that when you take a look at the government that's created by the framers of the federal constitution, its real character, that the number one thing, the most important thing was that it was Republican in nature. And the second thing is that it would, um, it would have all of the advantages of the federal system and the national system combined uh, when necessary. So he said, first, in order to ascertain, this is Madison and Federalist 39, in order to ascertain the real character of the government, it may be considered in relation to the foundation on which it is to be established. So how it would be ratified. It would be ratified by the states, hence in that way it was federal. To the sources from which its ordinary powers are to be drawn. Well, in part, the states would send senators uh, to the legislative branch and then uh, populations would send representatives to the house. So it's in part federal and part national in that way. To the operation of those powers, so the powers that is granted um, are national in character, but to the extent of them, uh, which Madison says cannot be deemed a national one, since the jurisdiction of the national government extends to certain enumerated objects only and leaves to the several states a residuary and inviolable sovereignty over all other objects. And then finally, uh, and to the authority by which the future changes, the amendment process in the government are to be introduced, it's neither wholly national nor wholly federal. You can have two different ways where you can amend uh, the constitution. So here Madison uh, applauding uh, what they've created and Tocqueville suggesting that that creation has been kind of unique in the history of modern republics and very much to the benefit of the United States. And one of the things that was really central to that ratification debate was the question of whether you would end up with a consolidated national government. So at least among the mainstream anti-federalists and federalists, you had an agreement that on paper you had partial consolidation, that you had some powers granted the national government and it had complete authority over those powers and could act directly upon the people in carrying out those powers. That was a national aspect of it because under the Articles of Confederation, you could only act as the national government through the states. Now you could act directly upon the people, but not for all matters. Now, the anti-federalists feared that over the course of time, 
necessary and proper clause, the supremacy clause, the federal judiciary would cause a consolidation of all power in the national government. And so the challenge that Madison and Hamilton and the other Federalist authors had to respond to was to show that the line would hold. That over the course of time, you could actually maintain this separation. This was a novel experiment, a novel creation. Could you actually have states sovereign in certain areas, the national government sovereign in certain other areas, and over the course of time, have those lines hold? That the states wouldn't take away national power, that the national government wouldn't take away state power, but you could actually maintain these two separate spheres appropriate to each station as matters were either truly national affairs or matters that were best handled at a local level. Could you maintain that over time? And, and of course, by the time you took those writing, we've got 50 years of history testing that proposition. And of course, by our own day, we've got another 180. And, and so we'll come back around to that as we move along in our discussion. Yeah, I think we're going to see in our headlines later in the show that uh, part of the problem is that what what is recognized as as the national government's jurisdiction extending to certain enumerated objects only and leaving to the state's sovereignty over all other objects. Well, are there are there any things right now that that the national government does not have sovereignty over? Uh, and yeah, you can, you can point out a few, but those enumerated enumerated objects have proliferated. Uh, and with that proliferation, you've seen the growing power of the national government uh, and its, uh, its growing sovereignty over over people and, and over states, et cetera, so, uh, which is part of the critique, right, of what's happened in the progressive era from the early 20th century onward. So anyway, this, the second passage that I want to take up from the end of this discussion of the federal constitution is called, Of the Advantages of the Federal System Generally and Its Special Utility for America. And in this subsection, Tocqueville talks about uh, the advantage that a small nation has. A small nation, he says, is a place that is a cradle of freedom. Quote, it has happened that most of them have lost that freedom by becoming large, which makes it very visible that freedom was due to the smallness of the people and not the people themselves. So the smaller the Republican political community, the more likely it is to retain a sense of freedom. And, and certainly we could turn to the township as an example of that freedom exercised. He goes on to say that the history of the world does not furnish an example of a great nation that has long remained a republic. All the passions fatal to republics grow with the extent of territory, whereas the virtues that serve as their support do not increase in the same measure end quote. Well, why? As ambition increases and the orbit of the republic is enlarged, men tend to want more, uh, more power. They tend to want uh, more ability to use that power uh, over a greater variety of different things as they're building out a great empire. Now, all of that said, Tocqueville recognizes that there's something to building out a nation and building out a republic, and that is that a republic needs to be able to defend itself. He says that a new element of national prosperity in the modern world is the ability for these nations to have the requisite force to defend their borders and to defend themselves against other nation states. So which are we to choose? Uh, the freedom uh, that uh, seems to be uh, placed within the smaller republic or the force that would allow you to defend uh, that nation uh, as you came into contact with external and internal threats. Well, Tocqueville says that the benefit to the Americans is that the federal constitution unites the diverse advantages resulting from the greatness and smallness of nations. The federal system is created just to do this. The union, he argues, is free and happy like a small nation, glorious and strong like a great one. Yeah, this is where Madison's idea of the extended republic really comes in, or a republic of republics. Because you think about the, the classic problems of the small republics, you don't have the danger of tyranny because the, the government's not, never so powerful enough that the you know, sort of consolidated gross tyranny, but you have the problem of conquest from your neighbors, and you have the problem of anarchy as, as faction takes over and democracy sort of spins out of control. So you solve that problem by becoming more powerful, well, fine, now you don't have to worry about being conquered. 
And now maybe you're not going to end up with anarchy, but how do you make sure you don't end up with tyranny? Uh, some consolidated, powerful government where some great executive is now able to use military force or other means in order to impose his will upon a people. Just as de Tocqueville is describing here, Madison's vision, as he lays it out in The Federalist, for this republic of republics is to have this balance that allows you to have enough power with the local self-government that can be a restraint on that national government. The third topic he takes up, Matt, which would be of interest to many viewers in his day, the 1830s, 1820s, is titled, What Keeps the Federal System from Being Within Reach of All Peoples and What Has Permitted the Anglo-Americans to Adopt It. So here in the 18-teens, 1820s, 1830s, there are a variety of different Latin American Republican revolutions taking place. Uh, and the, answer, the question may be, well, if this has worked out so well in the United States, why not take that blueprint and export it to other places, have them adopt the same strategy and end up uh, with the same excellent circumstance? Tocqueville says that this is not as easy as it sounds uh, because a, a, a nation needs to employ liberty over generations and learn how to practice liberty, uh, have an apprenticeship within liberty uh, in order to make a constitution like the one that's in the United States work. Uh, there are a variety of different measures that go into the, the building of the U.S. Constitution, and many of which he described earlier in the chapter, and all of those are intricate. Uh, and uh, to have experience with those in intricacies is to be able to better kind of work through problems and, and face the consequences of making the wrong decision and yet be able to, to move forward having worked within that system. A second reason why he says that uh, this will not be able to be spread abroad is that when he looks at the federal constitution, he looks at a union that is weak and that might be dissolved if, quote, federal law violently collided with the interests and principles of a state. It's really interesting here, right, that he's not worried about the great consolidation of power within a national government more than he's worried about uh, that power being dissolved. Now, of course, we'll have the uh, movement towards the Civil War just 20, 30 years after Tocqueville's writing, so there, there's something to what he's arguing. But for Tocqueville, this isn't just easy kind of, you know, uh, copy and paste and, and put it in another place because he, most countries around the world need that strong union. And then the, the, the final comment that, that he makes, the, the final requirement uh, for the federal system working is that there were good circumstances that went along with the good laws that were in place. America or Anglo-American civilization was a homogeneous civilization. Most of the different states had the same interests. They had no desire to fight foreign wars and they had the right location. They, they had no great wars to fear. So none of the things that usually um, produce government centralization were in place within the United States. So uh, it had, they, had you taken this type of government and you put it abroad, more likely you're gonna have that war. Now, you're gonna fight against an enemy. You're gonna see government centralization and you're gonna see the government uh, fall apart uh, or maybe become too powerful or fall apart as he mentioned earlier. And eventually he'll get there, right? And in, in volume two, he'll talk about just what will bring about the final consolidation of power in a democratic society. Talk about the danger of democratic despotism, the natural forces in democracies that push in that direction He'll talk about why it hasn't happened yet in America, but you also see why the fact that it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't happen over the course of time. That, that the things that are holding that consolidation back are these accidental features of the American context rather than essential qualities of a democratic society. Exactly, and I think that'd be my end take on this section, that the circumstances matter for a nation. Uh, its laws and institutions matter, but what matters most is its character. Character comes up over and over and over again in this work on the uh, future likelihood of the perpetuation of American democracy, rightly understood. So as, as you know, we have an adjacent reading every week, and we're trying to work our way through these adjacent readings chronologically. So uh, we've talked uh, about Homer, uh, and we've talked about Genesis. And for this week, uh, we're going to have an adjacent reading, uh, Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War, and a very important discussion that takes place at the beginning 
of that history known as the Spartan Assembly. Uh, here, the Spartans have held off uh, in fighting the Athenians uh, and the Spartan allies come uh, to Sparta and suggest uh, to the Spartans uh, that they need to take Athens seriously and they need to recognize, going back to this uh, issue that we just talked about, the importance of character on international systems. So here's what the Corinthians, one of the allies of the Spartans, have to say to the Spartans about their character and why character matters. Spartans, the confidence which you feel in your constitution and social order inclines you to receive any reflections of ours on other powers with a certain skepticism. Hence springs your moderation, but hence also the rather limited knowledge which you betray in dealing with foreign politics. Time after time, our voice raised to warn you of the blows about to be dealt us by Athens. And time after time, instead of taking the trouble to ascertain and wor the worth of our communications, you contented yourself with suspecting the speakers of being inspired by private interest. Well, the Corinthians go on to say and describe the Spartan character vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Athenian character. You Spartans of all the Hellenes are alone inactive and defend yourselves, not by doing anything, but by looking as if you would do something. You alone wait to the power of an enemy is becoming twice its original size instead of crushing it in its infancy. And yet the world used to say that you were to be depended upon. But in your case, we fear it said more than the truth. A Spartan Republic, a republic that had helped save the Greek world against the onslaught of the Persian Empire, is a republic that is defensive in nature. Uh, it considers itself right, to tend to want to take care of its own insular life. And that, according to the Corinthians, has enabled the Athenians to become a great, great problem in the Greek world. So I want to finish this, uh, this reference by, by taking on this great passage uh, later on in the Corinthian speech in which the Corinthians compare the Athenians and Spartans. And all of this, Matt, right, is, is to suggest, uh, once again, the importance of character, not only in understanding domestic affairs and the growth of particular nations, but, but foreign affairs. Character matters. So here's what the Corinthians argue. We contemplate the great contrast between the two national characters, the Spartan and Athenian character, a contrast of which, as far as we can see, you have little perception having never yet considered what sort of antagonists you will encounter in the Athenians. How widely, how absolutely different from yourselves. The Athenians are addicted to innovation and their designs are characterized by swiftness alike in conception and execution. You have a genius for keeping what you have got accompanied by a total want of invention. And when forced to act, you never go far enough. Again, they are adventurous beyond their power and daring beyond their judgment and in danger. Your want is to attempt less than is justified by your power, to mistrust even what is sanctioned by your judgment and to fancy that from danger, there is no release. Further, there is promptitude on their side against procrastination on yours. They are never home, you are never from it, for they hope by their absence to extend their acquisitions. You fear by your advance to endanger what you have left behind. They are swift to follow up a success and slow to recoil from a reverse. Their bodies they spend ungrudgingly in their country's cause. Their intellect they jealously husband to be employed in their service. A scheme unexecuted is with them a positive loss, a successful enterprise, a comparative failure. The deficiency created by the miscarriage of an undertaking is soon filled up by fresh hopes. For they alone are enabled to call a thing hoped for, a thing got by the speed with which they act upon their resolutions. Thus they toil on in trouble and danger all the days of their life with little opportunity for enjoying being ever engaged in getting. Their only idea of a holiday is to do what the occasion demands. And to them, laborious occupation is less of a misfortune than the peace of a quiet life. To describe their character in a word, one might truly say that they were born into the world to take no rest themselves and to give none to others. And of course, one of the things that's going on here in this passage, Matt, is this, this question that Tocqueville had posed between the advantages of being a large and a small nation. 
the Spartans seemed to reap the advantage defensively of being a small nation. The Athenians in their expansion, right, are taking on those qualities of an empire. And the question is, you know, is there some hybrid between the things that would have benefited Sparta on the one hand and the things that were benefiting Athens? Or uh, will you have these, uh, these regime characters continue to influence uh, foreign affairs in the Greek world? Uh, one of the great ironies of when you read on in Thucydides, Matt, is that the Athenians, uh, <laughs> over a long period of time, begin to take on a more Spartan-like character. And the Spartans do the reverse. And then it's not a good thing for either people. Yeah, it's interesting when you think about just this general point on understanding differences in national character, which is one of the, I think, the faults of at least some branches of our current foreign policy establishment, right? this sort of cosmopolitanism that doesn't take into account differences of national character and assumes everybody is this kind of transnational elite. All right, so a lot more to say on democracy in America, both volume one and volume two. Professor Corbin, what's our assignment for next week? So if you're using the Mansfield Winthrop edition, it'll be pages 165 through 186. And we're going to move into part two of volume one. And the subject matter is going to be how one can say strictly that the United States, the people govern. And then a continued discussion of how majorities are formed by the people through the party system, through the freedom of the press, and through political association. So I think three or four very, very pertinent topics to uh, 21st century American politics that, that Tocqueville will take up for next week. So the, the beginning of part two of, of volume one. All right. Well, let's turn to the headlines. And to do that, I want to try to distill at least a couple of the key points from what we've just been talking about. So if you think about the danger to free government and this way that that danger emerges as a nation grows in size and in power. And the success, it seems, according to Tocqueville, depends upon maintaining that constitutional balance between national and state government and also maintaining that national character, the commonality of interests and, and the, the national character that, that bound the people together in the first place. So let's, let's take a look at, at both sides of this and think about maybe some contemporary applications if we think of the issue of consolidation, go back a few pages. So to the part of the chapter that you didn't assign, but if you were reading along, you might have gotten to and maybe read through quickly. Page 119 in chapter eight, he says, the president of the United States possesses almost royal prerogatives, which he has no occasion to make use of, and the rights which up to now he can use are very circumscribed. The laws permit him to be strong, circumstances keep him weak. Long before we think about the imperial executive of the 20th and 21st century, the Tocqueville sees the possibility of that. He sees that if circumstances were to change, these powers might be very much available. And of course, this is especially true in times of war and crisis. Those occasions were few, as the Tocqueville points out, in 19th century America. But the progressive movement, uh, recognizing this and desiring to bring about just such a consolidation of power in the national executive, hit upon the idea, which is nicely summarized by William James in the title of one of his books, the moral equivalent of war. We couldn't possibly wish for more wars, right? No one wishes for more wars. But what if we can create causes and energy behind causes that's the moral equivalent of war to attack various social pathologies with the same energy, the same national unity, the same national purpose and consolidated power, wouldn't that be great? And wouldn't that perhaps give us a chance to win some victories over these pathologies that wouldn't otherwise be available to us? And so you, you probably recall Barack Obama's advisor, Rahm Emanuel, saying in 2008, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And of course, the financial crisis was a serious crisis in 2008. And the COVID crisis is a real crisis today. Uh, but the progressive temptation, especially when their policy preferences aren't popular, is to declare something a crisis and to try to inspire that moral equivalent of war, that type of sacrifice on behalf of it, and use those almost royal prerogatives to attack it. 
Yes, yeah, so you had mentioned before that if circumstances had changed, the use of that executive authority might change as well. And one of the interesting uh, ironies of the end of the 19th, early 20th century, Matt, is that we're at that time in the middle of an industrial age where our ability to be productive on a variety of different material fronts in terms of the encouragement of material well-being has really changed American life. And it is those same tools that many a progressive at the beginning of the 20th century think can be employed in these moral equivalents of war, right, to make the country a better place, uh, to encourage progressive justice. And you might say, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with trying to use the power that you have uh, over nature to create a better, more hospitable world uh, for mankind? Well, the danger occurs when you think that you have unlimited power. And the danger occurs when you try to do things that kind of go beyond the normal boundaries of how humans ought to use their powers. Yes, God has made us creative beings, the ability to use artifice, right, to make things better. State, statesmanship, for one, is one type of art that hopefully makes things better. But you can't make the world perfect. You can't overcome some things. And I think it's just that attempt that has tried to kind of make uh, the world perfectible that has been so dangerous in certain places in 20th century American history. And I think explains a lot of why when we have a government in place in the year 2021, a candidate goes around saying that they can solve every problem. And many people believe, okay, go ahead and solve them. And hence you get uh, what we've seen, I think over the last two or three weeks, it's not peculiar uh, to Democrats, Uh, Republicans do the same thing, but this idea that national power will be used, it will be used swiftly, and the problem will be solved quickly. Yeah, just to give a little bit more specific context to this, there was an interesting piece by the editors of National Review yesterday, uh, preemptively arguing against President Biden declaring a climate emergency for just such a purpose, to be able to then release executive power, and, and it wasn't like they just made up this idea, but uh, Chuck Schumer had told MSNBC's Rachel Maddow on Monday night that uh, Joe Biden should just do that, uh, should declare climate change a national emergency. And he said that would allow the president to do many, many things under the emergency powers. And as the editors of National Review unfold this, well, yes, of course, there would be many, many things that he could do. But, but would those be the kinds of things that constitutionally a president is supposed to do? Is there a climate emergency in the same sense that December 7th, 1941 brought a national emergency in the same sense that 9-11, 2001 brought a national emergency or for that matter, the financial crisis of 2008 or for that matter, a national pandemic. Is a climate emergency analogous to that? Would it be appropriate to set aside the normal give and take of the legislative process and turn to executive decree in order to resolve these matters. You know, you think about uh, the way that this tends to work in our hyperpartisan age. So, you know, Donald Trump declared a border emergency and that allowed him to free up funds to build his wall. And, and at that point, Senator Schumer said, it's outrageous. It's an outrageous power grab by a president who refuses to accept the constitutional separation of powers. In other words, Okay, you want to build a wall, you want to do these kind of things, great, but then get a law passed by Congress and you can do it. And, and so here we are, right? <laughs> different context, different issue, but Senator Schumer says, no, no, now, now we have an emergency and therefore let aside, set aside the constitutional process, set aside the role of Congress and, and let the executive do as the executive will please. And, and of course, you know, on the campaign trail, candidate Biden said you can't legislate by executive order unless you're a dictator. We're a democracy. We need consensus. And he was talking about tax policy, but the point is a broader point. Um, And yet here we are in his first six days, 21 executive orders and more, it seems, by the day. Efforts in various areas of policy, some of which are, are just repeals of Trump administration executive orders. So, you know, undo that or substitute this, but not all of them. Some of them are are plainly designed to advance important elements of the policy agenda or or to change in some dramatic ways, even the way that the government goes about its business. One example of that interesting uh, piece in Issues and Insights that said that 
uh, perhaps the most significant of those executive orders was one that would change a 40-year practice of requiring agencies to look at the cost and benefits of regulations before they're promulgated. So this went all the way back to the Reagan administration. Every, every presidency since, including Democratic presidencies, it's been one of the steps in promulgating a new regulation to look at the cost and benefit and make sure that this isn't just some outrageously costly thing that might bring about very limited real world benefit. And so now that's been set aside. And, and the expectation, of course, is, okay, well, then that means regulations that would otherwise fail this test or be obviously exposed as, as wasteful or unnecessary will now be able to get through. And, and there were many on the left that were celebrating this, something that seems like it's just sort of for the bean counters, right? One of those truly executive orders that could easily be overlooked with all the headline grabbing ones that we've uh, talked about or that others have talked about. But here's one that has a real possibility for transforming the way that the federal government operates. And by the way, talking about the constitutional separation of powers, allowing the bureaucracy to step in the place for the Congress. Yeah, I can't see much good uh, coming coming from this. I I, I just think back to uh, we had mentioned earlier the progressive movement and really the this is really an outgrowth a hundred years later of Woodrow Wilson's idea that um, we need to move beyond uh, congressional stalemate and and we need to kind of take power and and employ it uh, and at the executive level uh, and do so in a way that uh, we solve problems we solve them quickly and and I, I think that uh, you will see if a, a Republican presidents elected in 2024, 2028, these same emergency powers, the same executive order regime be used on the other side. So, you know, further and further we move a field from a constitutional republic. Yeah. And there's no reason to think that anybody is going to abandon the use of this power when it seems like in an age where we have closely contested Congresses and it's not easy to get bills through you say, well, I, I got to do something. I, I want to, you know, people that voted for me, voted for me for a reason. I've got to please my constituency. And, and if I can't do everything, I've got to do something. I'll do it by, by executive order. And so, as you say, we, we, we give up the habits and the practices that go along with constitutional majority rule. Now, let's, let's look at a second issue. So now we're talking about the issue of the common good and national character. And, you know, there's a lot, obviously, we could say on that point. But uh, while we're on the topic of executive orders, just yesterday, President Biden issued an executive order to set aside the Mexico City policy, which was first established, again, by President Reagan to prevent foreign aid from being used directly or indirectly to fund abortions abroad. Now, what's interesting, if you listen to his signing statement, you wouldn't have any idea that that's what this executive order was about. And the second, uh, uh, the second uh, order I'm going to be signing also changes what the president has done, the president, the, the president what the former president uh, has done, and that uh, a memorandum reversed the, my predecessor's attack on women's health, <laughs> excuse me, health access, and uh, as we continue to battle COVID-19, even more critical Americans have meaningful uh, access to health care. Okay, so it's critical that Americans have meaningful access to health care as we battle COVID-19. That's his summary of what's going on in repealing the Mexico City policy, which prevents federal aid, once again, from being spent directly or indirectly on abortions abroad. You kind of wonder whether he was reading off a different set of notes because there's just no connection between what the order is doing and what he suggests that it's doing. Yeah, and if you go further into the clip, he talks about it a second time. So he signs his first executive order, which deals with Medicaid and Obamacare. Then he comes back to the second one, and he talks about access to affordable health care as it relates to reproductive rights. So he, he, he finally gets in at least some reference in the vague ballpark of abortion. But now, we could say a lot about how abandoning a culture of life undermines the common good, but I think it's worth thinking about this policy from the perspective of the president's call for unity in his inaugural address. Now, I mean, you could say, okay, but he's just repealing a policy that was put in place by Republicans, and it's no more divisive than Reagan imposing it, and then Clinton removing it, 
and then Bush putting it back and back and forth we go. And that's the way it's been over these last 40 years. And from the standpoint of our discussion of executive orders, maybe that's true. But there's a difference between supporting abortion abroad and forcing Americans directly or indirectly to pay for it. And one of the reasons for our present division is that on social and cultural issues, progressives are too often unwilling to deal with the moral seriousness of their opponents. So if you disingenuously and euphemistically call subsidizing abortion providing access to health care, and thereby pretend that opposition to abortion is derived from some sort of mean-spirited hatred of women rather than a profound concern for unborn human children, you're just not playing politics the way it ought to be played, and you're certainly not going to build unity because everybody who's against abortion knows they're not against abortion because they hate women. They're caring about the life of an unborn child. And so you can tell even as the president talks about this, uh, what he says and how he says it, that, that he knows better, uh, but he doesn't say better. If you want to promote unity, then concede that opponents of abortion are after something more than creating some handmaid's tale dystopia. And, you know, you might do yourself a little political good along the way. There was a, a poll that just came out. 70% of Americans, including 55% of Democrats, actually oppose using tax dollars to support international abortion. And even domestically, 55%, including 31% of Democrats, oppose using tax dollars to fund abortion. So there's an appreciation among the general public that it's, it's one thing to have a policy that allows for something. It's another thing that requires everybody to, to, to fund it. And the American public, if not the Democratic Party, seems willing to draw the line there. Well, another thing this discussion makes me think back to from last week is the definition and discussion of democracy in President Biden's inaugural address. Democracy is not simply a vote carried out that elects a president for four years uh, in which you know, the, the spout of democracy is thereafter turned off. There's a democratic political process because we live in a democratic republic. And this is how policies should be made. So if you're going to be embracing of unity, right, you've actually got to take into account that other people may disagree with you for good reason on these policies. But if you're also going to be in favor of democracy, you've got to channel your vision of a just society through the democratic republic, through our democratic political processes. And that just doesn't seem, at least two weeks in, what is going to happen in the Biden administration. Now, that may change. Well, we can hope that it's going to change. I, I would say this, if you are a, a Democratic voter and you voted for Vice President uh, Biden and you did so uh, because you believe in all of his, po his policies, he certainly, as, as Democrats usually do, have, have paid off your vote with hard currency. He's kind of given you what you wanted but is the long-term damage of giving what you want, giving you what you want quickly to the Republic worthwhile the immediate victory? All right, well, let's turn now to the grade book. Uh, this would normally be the week of the NFL's Pro Bowl between the conference championship games and the Super Bowl, uh, but that's been canceled because of COVID. Uh, well, I guess we should say sort of canceled because they're actually going to stage some sort of virtual Pro Bowl using – the Madden NFL video game. And I don't know about you, Dave, but uh, I, I, I literally can't think of anything in the world that I find as boring as watching somebody else play a video game. So I will be taking a hard pass on that one. But in sort of honor of this sort of Pro Bowl, uh, we're going to grade this week the typical major sports all-star games. All right, so let's, let's start with one that's actually apparently might be played this year which is the NBA All-Star Game. What, what grade do you give that, Dave? Well, I want to kind of go back a little bit in history and talk about this All-Star Game from the vantage point of your basketball skills or, or lack thereof. <laughs> oh, boy. In three-on-three -three matches in the past, you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have invited Matt to be on your team because he was an offensive threat. You know, he wouldn't be called a sniper. Um, I, I think you, you believe that you were uh, a defensive entity. You know, that, that's a fair point, yeah. Okay. Long so, arms, uh, yeah. shot blocker. 
kind of yeah, minute no. bowl was my was, was right. my model. Right. In so many ways. But anyway, um, so I, I'm going to use the, you know, the, the Matt Parks, you know, uh, talent for basketball uh, grade for my NBA All-Star game because there's, there's no defense played. Uh, pretty much it's just like they, they drive up the court and then they just let the other team go back. Um, it's like a herd going back and forth. So not, not fun. Uh, it, uh, the cu- last couple of minutes, perhaps, when they start to play a little bit of defense, you, know, you, you might, that may be an A, but uh, you know, up until when it's 179 to 178, it's, it's not really fun to watch. So I'm giving that a D. I probably would not uh, tune into to that all-star game. All right. Yeah. I mean, obviously the, what we need is more of my style basketball, right. To make this an entertaining game. Mm-hmm. Now that, that is the biggest fault of the all-star game. I mean, the one thing you can say is that, you know, you get some crazy alley-oops, you get some, you know, 45 foot shots. Why not? So there, there are some, you know, these are the best athletes in the world doing amazing things. And you get moments like that, but as a basketball game, it is bad. So I, I'm not maybe quite as down on it as you, but I'm going to give it a C minus. Second one we're going to rate is the, the usual Pro Bowl. I think like the, the All-Star game, it's, it's a little bit pitiful. I, I think the other thing that's a problem with it, it's, it's played the week prior to the Super Bowl, and it's played after all of these great playoff games where you know, teams are going all out and putting all of their energy into it. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're in Honolulu, and it's, it's not really kind of a football game. And um, – so, and, and the other thing, I mean, I'll look at this from a Patriots angle. I mean, whenever the Patriots used to get invited to the Pro Bowl, which didn't, well, it didn't happen much, right? Because we were always in the Super Bowl. We always kind of give away our Pro Bowl nomination. Right. And the reason why is, you know, uh, you know, gospel according to Bill, right? It's championships that matter, not Pro Bowl appearances. So I'm going to likewise give the Pro Bowl a D. So I'm, I'm down on these all-star games thus far. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now Pro Bowl is, it's a disaster. I mean, NBA All-Star Game, no defense. The Pro Bowl, no offense or defense. You know, they've got rules to protect the players, which is obviously smart. You, you can't imagine the disaster it would be to lose, you know, some great quarterback for a season because of some Pro Bowl injury. But there's just no real effort. There's no scheming. There's nothing interesting happening in terms of the play on the field. If you're a veteran, you just find any way to beg off it. Oh, you know, tweak that ankle. And I'm not going to be able to make it this time around. So it's not even an all-star game, right? It's sort of like, you know, the, you're like 60th percentile players playing slow motion football, total disaster. Well, thank goodness we'll have the real virtual thing this year. Yeah, no, that's going to be great. But uh, I'm going to give it a D minus. Yeah, the, the Pro Bowl, I, I have no interest in the, in the real Pro Bowl or the virtual Pro Bowl. All right, last one for us, Major League All-Star Game. I'd give it an A. I, I love the All-Star game. I've, I've always loved the All-Star game. And, and baseball is not my favorite sport. Football is. But it always comes in July, that, that Tuesday in July. There's, it's, it's got a certain feel to it. I like the additions that uh, Major League Baseball has done. I think that home run derby the day before is a lot of fun to watch. Can we we uh, choose which, which player we think is going to win that. So that's kind of a family affair. So, yeah, and, and an actual game is played. There's a reason to watch. And, uh, and the teams play hard, and you have all the great players there. Plus, you have all these great matchups. I mean, there's nothing better than watching just a you know, great pitcher you know, take on a great hitter. Uh, especially uh, when you see them not play each other that much. It's a, it's really kind of a neat thing. It's a great game overall. I'll give it an A. Yeah, I'm going to give it a, a B plus. I think it, I would have given it an A about 20 years ago before interleague play. You know, it was that one moment other than the world series where you would see national league stars against American league stars. And you just have these classic matchups. It is definitely the closest thing to an actual game. Obviously the pitchers don't pitch as long, but you know, today the way the starting pitchers are, throwing fewer and fewer innings it's not actually that much different from from an all-star game so from a competitive standpoint it's it's great it, it does tend to be weird in that you know you have these long streaks of national league winning or the american league winning and and so you know you don't always necessarily get a great game and you know tightly contested but still as an exhibition it actually is baseball the score resembles a normal baseball score and everyone's doing normal baseball things just at a higher level with elite players. So I'm going to give that one the B plus and uh, boy, I hope we get a good all-star game this summer. It'd be fun to be able to have 
fans back in the seats and, and the full celebration that goes along with that. All right. Well, as always, we wrap up the show with the Tocqueville's crystal ball. Uh, last week, we were 50-50. So we, we both took the Packers and a close but low-scoring game with the Bucks. That didn't work out, right? Bucks uh, win the game, and of course, it was a 57 points, 31 to 26. So wrong on both fronts there. But on the other hand, we both took the Chiefs and a high-scoring game in the AFC Championship. We were right about that, 38-26 victory for the Chiefs. What more to say about the Super Bowl next time as we look forward to that? I kind of feel like I've turned this corner on this crystal ball thing. I, you know, now three and three for 2021. It's definitely been a, a new year for me, and and I just feel confident about you know my picks on this front. So all right, back from where I was, you know, where I think I got 20 percent of things right in, in 2020. I'm I'm on the right track here. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. That's that's true. You're you're trending in the right direction. So we've got a real important uh, life, really consequential pick for you this week, Dave. Uh, As no doubt you know, Tuesday is probably the most important day of the year in the Northeast, otherwise known as Groundhog's Day. And the question before us, before the world, or at least before all those that live in cold weather climates is, will Punxsutawney Phil see his shadow or not? Now, I I realize, having set it up this way, that those of you who, who live in sunny Pasadena or the, the sunny hill country of Texas, you, you're not even sure if it is winter. Where is Pennsylvania? Yeah, Definitely yeah, right, so. right, exactly. But, but we know about winter, as we said at the top of the show. So this is no idle sport. Dave, just a reminder, if Phil sees his shadow, that's bad. All right, so a sunny day in Punxsutawney is not what we're looking for. That means six more weeks of winter. If he doesn't, spring is just around the corner. So what do you think? I think he's going to see a shadow. I really do. And I'm not trying to say that just to kind of rub it in to all <laughs> you folks in the Northeast. The funny thing is when we talk with our relatives in New Hampshire, it's always like sunny and 40 there. Like they always remind us of how the weather is so great. But um, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I see him seeing a shadow, six more weeks of winter. You know, it's just until March 10th, 15th. It's not... You can, you can handle that, right? Well, I mean, we may have to, but we'd rather not handle that. I, I, you know, there's usually one weekend in February where it's like 65, 70 degrees, and you're just like, wow, this, this, this could happen. Right? This yeah. spring, spring is actually going to come. But usually it's a tease, and you end up with, you know, it is end of March before you actually start to get consistently decent weather. If that, sometimes April, you're still got the heat on and, and three, three sweaters and all the rest. But I'm going to be optimistic. I, I, I have to admit, I, I looked a little bit on, online, and the weather forecast for Punxsutawney is calling for clouds after two days of snow. So it'll definitely be winter before February 2nd. But I think there's going to be clouds that day that Phil is not going to see his shadow and that we are all going to be in for an early spring. All right. Well, that's it for today. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Please remember to subscribe and review the show on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, you can find us on Instagram at Democracy in America Today and contact us by email, democracyinamericatoday at gmail.com. We look forward to talking to you next week.